Okay, this video is a response to God Guns Guts and Glory's video, 100 Reasons Why Evolution is Stupid. Now, this video is going to be a challenge to 4G. I'm challenging you. Um, and I will put the actual specific, the details uh, of the questions I want you to try to answer at the end of this video. Uh, but for the time being, I'm the, this is what I want from you. This is what I'm actually I'm asking you to do. I don't think you can do it. I really, truly don't. I hope you will accept the challenge to try to prove me wrong. What I want you to do is I want you to respond to a few, or actually pick one if you want to, as many or as few as you, of, as you wish, of the actual scientific claims that I'm refuting here from Hoven's video you posted. Okay, I know you put my name down you know, in the, in the list of tags, so I'm assuming it was meant for me. Um, I would like you to actually respond to any one of them and actually respond to it using science. You claimed in many other videos that you, like Hoven, love science um, and are very knowledgeable about science. So please, use that. Don't just say Darwin was a pervert or this guy has friends and his, his YouTube subscribers are all perverts so therefore we can ignore everything he says. Actually respond to the argument. I don't think you can do it, okay? I really, truly don't. I think what you're going to do, chances are you'll ignore this video completely. Or if you do respond to it, it'll be another one of your videos where you laugh and mumble to yourself, calling me a bunch of names, insulting my subscriber base, my friends list, all of that kind of stuff, and then tell some anecdote about how Darwin's children were a bunch of failures, even though oh, he had ten children and seven of them ended up being, um, well, highly successful. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure where that kind of thing comes from. But the point of it is, I'm challenged. I'm saying, can you actually do that? I'm not going to insult you. I'm not here. I'm not in this video. I am not insulting you in the slightest bit. I'm, I'm trying to start a, maybe start a new era here. I'm going to respond to you respectfully. And I want to see if you are even capable of doing the same. Okay, now the beginning of this video, the beginning of the Hoven video, uh, Kent Hoven starts talking about some debate thing, and he talks about... Uh, two of the questions that he wanted to d discuss in, in this debate, um, neither of which appeared. Um, I'm not going to, I don't want to discuss these in this video because the primary focus of this video was on the Big Bang um, and the um, conservation of angular momentum. And I want to stick to that. I do want to answer, I do want to talk about his first two points, um, but I think I'm going to do it in another, another video, not part of this challenge video. So I will probably get to that as soon as possible. I think I've got a good way to explain it. Those are actually specific biological questions. The remainder of the stuff has nothing to do with biological evolution. Again, it's on the Big Bang Theory. So, um, the first thing he, he started... The, now, Hoven loves to tell the story of sitting on a plane with this hypothetical Berkeley professor he claims is real. I don't believe it for a second, but nonetheless, it doesn't matter if it's real or not real. Um, the reality is that if the conversation went as Hoven says, the professor was a complete idiot and had no business teaching college in any field, um, and I'm, you know, almost certainly was not any, anywhere connected to physics or, or um, cosmology or any, any related field of that. Um, because what he starts off with is he talks about this Big Bang theory, about how the origin of the matter in the Big Bang, but the reality is when he talk, what he's really talking about, um, it, when, the first thing we would remotely call matter involved in the Big Bang theory are, are fermions. Um, these proto-matter particles that didn't exist during the initial stages of the Big Bang. They only existed after, and I don't know exactly the timeline of it, when the universe, the expanding universe, cooled sufficiently enough to allow, that these, allow these particles to start to, to form. Um, either way, the point of it is he, he, ta he, he so supposedly in this conversation stumps the professor uh, with a number of points. Um, again, all of them, they're all very much straw men, they're all nonsensical. An actual professor who knew anything about even a basic level of knowledge of this uh, would have immediately discounted Hoven's, um, just it discounted his questions as ridiculous, let alone um, claiming complete ignorance about them. But then what Hoven um, does here, and I thought this was kind of funny and kind of proof to me that this story is completely false, um, and it doesn't matter if it's false. I mean, I understand using a story to illustrate a point. He says, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? And the professor says, no. And then Hoven says, oh, you, you should. You learn a lot of physics from a merry-go-round. Um, which is really, really funny because the reality is Berkeley, if somebody asked, if you asked any faculty, staff, student at UC Berkeley, do you guys have a merry-go-round? 
um, anybody who actually was there would say, yeah, and point to the, in Tilden Park, they've got a very large and famous merry-go-round. Um, it's actually a carousel, but it's called, it's called the merry-go-round. But traditional merry-go-rounds, as he describes in the story, are found in several places on Berkeley campus where there are several children's playgrounds on Berkeley campus. So there are merry-go-rounds on Berkeley's campus, and to say there isn't is just Hoven's stupidity. What it, the point he's trying to bring up here is he's trying to do this whole, you know, egghead scientists with their colliders and their, their complex equations can easily be stumped by somebody who just observes a childhood playground and, and can learn more physics from that. That's really what he's, that's the, that's the, an appeal that he makes to the audience. Um, it always gets a good laugh, um, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the point of it is, is that he then uses this barrig around to describe angular momentum, claiming that um, the analogy he's making is that we, we scientists believe that the singularity that formed the Big Bang was a spinning dot, um, and that it spun and flung off parts, and that all of those parts should all be spinning in the same direction as the original singularity. He uses the merry-go-round to illustrate it. Um, but he makes a fundamental flaw here, and this has been addressed. I'll put links down below to um, some excellent rebuttals of this. The point of it is, the theory of angular momentum in no way says when those kids flew off the merry-go-round, they would not be spinning at all. They would be flying off straight. They would fly off in a straight line that happens to be tangential at a 90 degree angle to the direction of spin. Okay, they themselves would not be spinning unless they were already spinning on the on the um, merry-go-round, unless they were spinning around while it was going around and they were also spinning. If they were just hanging on for dear life, they would not continue to spin. Okay, so. <laughs> This argument is its nonsensical. It has no bearing whatsoever to the theory of angular momentum. Uh, he's just, it, it sort of, if you kind of think about it superficially, you think, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And that's what he's trying to appeal to. He's appealing to a common fallacy of, of you know, because a lot of concepts in physics, even basic physics, even Newtonian physics and things, are kind of counterintuitive. If you just sort of think about it, you'd think this would happen, but in reality, something else happens. And when you understand how it works, you understand why this something else happens, and it makes sense. Um, but he's appealing to a layperson's understanding of physics. He's a layperson's understanding of the theory of angular momentum, which is just an offshoot of the theory of, of the conservation, law of conservation of energy. Um, and that's it. But the point that he's missing in this is that even if we allow that the universe of singularity was a spinning dot and it flew apart and the spinning structures fell off of it, even if we allow for that, um, Nobody in Big Bang Theory claims that our sun, our solar system, or any other solar system that we can see um, came from that initial expansion of the Big Bang. The Big Bang expanded into a universe filled with nothing but hydrogen and some helium. That helium later coalesced, forming the first stars. Those stars, generations ago, lived out their lifespans, collapsed, exploded, forming new material, heavier materials, that then also coalesced, formed new stars, exploded. Okay, we're multi-generations away from the Big Bang event. Um, the rotation of, our, of objects in our solar system and our galaxy um, are based on the uh, localized gravitational events. Okay, that's why some galaxies spin the wrong way. Uh, things like in our, in our own galaxy, we, we can model a number of events that would explain Venus is practically upside down, for example. Uranus is laying on its side. Um, dozens more of the moons that he talks about, than he actually describes, go the wrong way, not that there's really a right way. So, um, so he's just outright false in this claim. Okay, Hovind makes the claim uh, that there should be an equal number of star births to star deaths. And then he focuses on supernova, which, by the way, all stars don't explode into supernova. Only um, certain classes of stars will ever form a supernova. But that aside, he says that there's only 300 supernova remnants observable, and yet there should be millions or trillions or whatever he claims, given the number of stars that, we, that exist in the known universe. Um, obviously, Hoven, again, is speaking to the ignorant. He doesn't quite understand what he's talking about here. Uh, there is a on, online, I'll put a link down below, a database uh, of supernova events. Uh, in this year alone, um, since 2011, there's been 16 supernova reported in this dis just since the beginning of this year. In one month, there have been 16 supernova reported. Um, 
adding up the total number of supernova events recorded in this database comes out to be 5,686 supernova recorded. Okay, not 300. Where this 300 number comes from is beyond me. He's, uh, I, I think, making something up here. It's simply not true. So it's interesting to cite Frederick Hoyle. Frederick Hoyle saying that when he evidence for the something about a sickly Paul and the Big Bang. Um, now, by saying that, I guess what he's saying is, is that Fred Hoyle is such a genius, um, you know, this the, this brilliant scientist Fred Hoyle, that we can certainly accept what he says, you know, with all authority, right? Um, so therefore, if he thinks the Big Bang is false, then therefore it, it must be false, right? Because he's such a great scientist. Well, then, does Mr. Hoven believe that? Uh, Oh, I don't know, interstellar creation of life and, and vast waves of, of viruses traveling through the known galaxy, spreading life on life-bearing planets, which is what Fred Hoyle believes. Fred Hoyle believes that life is formed in the interstellar vacuums of space along with matter and such in this great creation cauldron that spills out over the known universe, seeding planets with life. That's what he believes. So therefore, Hoven must believe it too, right? Or does Hoven think that's equally ridiculous? Okay, I, he ends this with uh, his talk on Gentry's, uh, Robert Gentry's polonium halos, which uh, I'll put links down below. There are some excellent, excellent rebuttals of this entire concept. Um, it, his, his entire theory relies on a 1917 uh, idea that these halos were even caused by polonium, which is jolly, or no, 1921, I believe. Um, our researcher named Jolly attributed these halos to polonium. That subsequently was called into doubt. Gentry is citing that material as evidence that these are even polonium in the first place, that they're even the result of alpha decay. Um, they could be the result of beta decay. There's a number of models that show that these halos can be created by beta decay. Um, other than that, even if they are alpha decay, there's now just intense study of these has shown that micro cracks and things allow radon gas to get into these cracks. Radon gas does produce these halos as well. So he's simply, uh, the, that whole thing, I'll, I'll, again, I'll put links down below. Okay, God, guns, guts, glory. Here's the challenge to you. Without resorting to ad hominem insults, okay, without resorting to those tactics, without insulting things that have no bearing, without talking about Darwin, who doesn't even enter into this conversation, Darwin was not a cosmologist, I want you to explain to me, first, find me one single example, one actual scientific report where anybody says that the Big Bang involved anything actually spinning. Okay? Anything. Find me, even even a discarded idea would do, find me where anyone else outside of Hoven has ever claimed that the Big Bang began as a spinning dot. Okay. Find me a explanation of the law of angular of the law of angular momentum that involves an object flying off of a spinning object and then beginning to spin itself. Okay, not okay. Find find me where where that actually exists. I want to see one any example again, not something citing Hoven, an actual explanation. It can be from a grade school textbook on, on, on such things, if you can find it. It can be on a physics, college level physics. I don't care where you find it. Find me anything that says that a spinning object, fl something flying off of a spinning object is going to go anything other than in a straight line. Okay? Uh, I want to see that. Uh, because the fact is, they don't fly off spinning. They fly off facing whatever direction they're facing when they flew off, and they fly off in a in a straight line at a tangent to the, the, the direction of rotation. So those are the two, two, two main points I really want you to actually address. Please. Um, again, I, I'm challenging. If you can't, if you don't respond to this, okay, um, I, even if it, you do it in a text, I don't care, but I'd prefer a video. But if you don't respond to this, I'm, or you respond in the way like I've already described, I think you will, uh, which is just insulting me or finding some ad hominem way um, or making up an excuse to ignore those things, I'm going to conclude it's because you don't know how to refute those arguments, that you don't actually have enough of a scientific background to even start discussing the fundamentals of this. Okay? And that's my challenge. So we'll see where it stands. Uh, okay. Some to die.